Welcome to The Lens with me, Sarah Travers. The Lens is a business in the community podcast in partnership with One Young World. I'm delighted that I'm joined by guests today, Adrian Curry, Managing Director of NCIRC, a global market leader in sustainable packaging, making around 4 billion glass containers every year. And Wen Yu Wang, Principal Consultant of Energy and Utilities Practice, PA Consulting. Now in this episode, we'll be exploring environmental sustainability and climate action. The UK has committed to achieving net zero by 2050, but many scientists are saying that we are not scared enough about the implications of global warming. With that in mind, how are businesses taking practical action and innovating to make a difference? Well, to find out, let's get into the conversation. Adrian, when you, welcome to The Lens. So let's find out a little bit more about both of you. Adrian, if I could start with you, if you could tell our listeners a little bit about yourself, your background and how your career has developed to bring you to the role of Managing Director of NSERC. Thanks, Sarah. Yeah, I went to university in Jordanstown. Didn't didn't stay very long, I have to admit. One year was enough for me. So I left and went to work for a local company in Fermanagh at the time. Very well-respected uh, company, doing a lot of really good things. And it was a very exciting prospect at the age of 20 or 21 at the time. And the company was really focused on local materials, so sand and gravel, and adding value to these materials to produce building products, essentially. So I got a job and a new project to build a, a factory to make new lightweight building blocks. And uh, that went quite well. And then the, the owner of the company at the time asked me, would I like to get involved in a project to make glass? So at 23, 24 years of age, the answer was yes, because it sounded really exciting. And then the question for me was, well, what kind of glass? And the answer from him was, well, we don't exactly know yet. We're going to have a look at the market and see, but we have high silica sand. We can add value to it by manufacturing glass, and we think there's an opportunity. Why don't you come on board the project team, of which there was four of us at the time? So that's really where I started my career in, in glass. And um, since that, I worked in operations originally, starting up the plant in Fermanagh. And uh, then quickly, we moved to build a plant in England. And really, we, we grew the business uh, very, very quickly. So I've been managing director now for 18 years. So uh, today, we're quite a large uh, company in our sector. We produce about 4 billion bottles every year, mostly for sale in UK and Ireland. That's close to 40% of all glass bottles consumed. We also uh, do quite a lot of filling. So we import wine on behalf of brand owners all around the world. We fill the wine, we fill soft drinks, ciders, beers, and we distribute these around the UK as well. We employ about 2000 people uh, in that process. And we turn over about eight, 900 million euros a year at this point. We have a good business, very well invested, well established, but we have some quite exciting plans for the future as well. Tell us a little bit of history about glass and how it's actually made, just for those of us who don't perhaps know or haven't really thought about it. Everybody has glass in their lives, window panes to glass bottles, glass jars, uh, drinking glasses, glass in cars, glass in telephones, uh, you know, all sorts of applications. So I think the first glass containers were made in something like 1500 BC. We have an opportunity here to reinvent our product and to make it, you know, a sustainable product and a future product for everybody to enjoy. You know, people don't like it because of, it uses too much energy and things. I think we can address these issues and address them quite quickly. And I'm pretty passionate about decarbonizing our industry with some firm plans to do that. Your glass is definitely half full then. Yeah, I can resist. When you were delighted to have you with us today too, and your bio, it has to be said, is very impressive, a real high achiever. Um, I see that you actually went to university at age 15. Please share with us how you've come to be in your present role and where where you get your passion for energy and sustainability from. Yes, um, thank you, Sarah. So I have a pretty unorthodox path for how I got into consulting. Just a little bit about my job right now. On a day-to-day -day basis, all my work is related to clean energy and sustainability. The easy way to put this is we work with anyone, whether it is governments, organizations, businesses, entrepreneurs, etc., to help them become a productive and proactive member of the transition to a world that would be much more sustainable and lower carbon. I studied uh, pre-medicine. At that age, when I was in university, I've always saw scientists and doctors 
as the highest echelons of society they represented to me at that time the most significant achievement you can have and and for the longest time i quickly shut down a lot of work that i thought for me was less interesting or less rigorous and but when i was studying pre medicine i quickly realized that this was not right for me it doesn't take advantage of a lot of my strength or curiosity i think there is no bigger challenge in our modern society than the challenge of climate change and environmental degradation for that reason i find myself waking up every morning not requiring to motivate myself because you don't need to be motivated if you have a mission if i have to do anything else in consulting i probably wouldn't um this is more of a job working in clean energy and consulting is the venue to do that rather than the main goal if that makes sense absolutely and when you in your experience what are you seeing in relation to energy climate action and sustainability what are those biggest challenges but also those opportunities um i think one of the most interesting thing is really seeing the increasing mainstreaming of sustainability and net zero especially amongst businesses and i think adrian touched upon this as well it's very clear to me that we're moving beyond a world where the only reason for pursuing sustainability and environmental initiatives for businesses is regulation and compliance that's no longer the case and if you only look at the last few years if you look at cop26 for example last year businesses were making a lot of noise and a lot of difference in not only driving innovation but actually driving ambitions up in many many countries businesses are actually ahead of where the government is and this mainstreaming of net zero and sustainability in business ambitions moving beyond regulation and compliance looking at the advantages in terms of not just reputation but also things like innovation and talent recruitment and retention is immense just a little anecdote i used to work for another consulting firm and we pulled the graduates who were coming in the top two priorities for them one was work life balance and the second was the contribution to important environmental issues like climate change and sustainability so it is a huge asset to be a company that takes it seriously Absolutely. And Adrian, if I bring you in at that point, regulation and compliance, is that what made businesses sit up and take note? Regulation and compliance absolutely has its place. Can really drive some agendas, but regulation and government strategy can, you know, influence consumers and what they do. I think from a, a business point of view, we've always been uh, quite disruptive within our business we've always you know thought how can we do things different and what what is the important things that we need to do for the future we really had to take stock a number of years ago we talked a little bit about the virtues of glass and it's infinitely recyclable we can produce glass with 100% recycled content you know the health benefits of glass are, are very clear compared to other packaging materials but we use a, a huge amount of energy and fossil fuels So how do we really move away from that? Our business is completely reliant on people purchasing glass bottles. You know, we know a lot of brand owners are very reliant on that as well. So how do we marry those two things to make sure that we do the right thing? Businesses are becoming aware that they need to do things. Bigger organizations are certainly moving faster because they're being influenced by shareholders. And consumers probably to a lesser degree in really honest um, I think consumers haven't really started to to move in the right direction just yet but for our business we did take a step back and we thought well how can we challenge ourselves and one of the ways is to look at science based targets we've introduced them uh, right across our current our own business and circ and indeed our parent business as well and we've really set ourselves very challenging targets because uh, it is difficult for our industry to move away from fossil fuels but by putting those targets out there it has focused us what it's done as well it, it's brought our our customers in you know so you imagine the big brands in the food and drinks industry they are now coming to us going okay what are you going to do and how can we help you because we are part of the scope 3 for these larger brands we have our responsibility there to try and reduce our emissions to improve their overall sustainability and ultimately to make consumer packaging much more sustainable in the future. The science-based target's brilliant, but I also believe Encirc was announced as the Northern Ireland Responsible Company of the Year. But what does this accolade actually mean for Encirc and then how can Encirc help others? We were absolutely delighted to 
received the award. I think there's kind of two aspects to that. So number one, it was great recognition for what the business has done and particularly the people in the business because we have some huge goals out there. We have some big initiatives, but really when you look within our business, the really exciting thing as well is that people have formed small committees within the business. They're looking at the smaller things, which add up to the bigger things. And, you know, there's a lot of people within the business that are on some heroes and to receive a award like that you know shows us that we're doing the right thing and gives some recognition it also comes with a responsibility i believe how do we keep pushing the boundaries we are a good company we were a good company by many kpis you know most of them financially based how do we become a great company what does that mean and how can we move in that direction so i think winning the award has acknowledge the, the good work that's been done so far, but it's probably challenging us even more in the future. So now we have, we're have we in this space, what more can we do? We do quite a lot. I'm, I'm involved in quite a few external organizations like British Glass, Glass Futures in the Northwest of England here, Northwest Business Leaders, and Net Zero Northwest. We're part of a bigger community in Northern Ireland and in the Northwest of England looking at how we can share experiences and what we can do to, to move things faster. Engage with government is very important because, you know, if we look at alternative fuels, often the financial case doesn't work. I think consumers aren't able or aren't ready to pay more for products, which is a concern. So government are going to have to find a way, I think, with taxpayer money to support the right initiatives and try and move things faster. As a wider community and group of businesses, for example, we can do quite a bit there to influence. We, uh, two years ago, a year and a half ago, we produced glass bottles for the first time ever in the world with 100% recycled material and 100% biofuel. Our bottles were actually displayed in COP26. And again, that has gained quite an awareness, Sarah, but it's helped our industry to really show that these things are possible. So if you show the art of the possible, then how do you do it on an ongoing basis? I suppose is the challenge that we take back from that. When you, this must be very heartening for you to hear um, the story of Enser and their sustainability journey. And I know that you do an awful lot of work as a trusted advisor to startups also wanting to do better. Is it always the examples that they need to hear? Is it really useful to actually have a template? Really, sometimes it's like, where do you start? I think it is, I would imagine, heartening for a lot of startups that we work with to hear these stories from much larger corporations that also manage to make their transition. In many ways, the challenges there could be harder because you have to work with many more existing institutions within your firm and existing practices. And sometimes it is much easier to start from a blank slate. I think another challenge that startups often have is just bridging the gap between idea uh, prototypes and why commercialization. You know, this is obvious, but I think a lot of the startups that we work with are already producing new technologies. They're providing new solutions that currently don't exist in the market. And getting to the point where people have tried and trusted these solutions, and therefore this can be rolled out into mass commercial scale, still requires a lot more support, whether it is from the investing community or from the government. What exciting innovative developments are you seeing in your area of work? Uh, so, for example, seeing some of the most uh, innovative approach to long duration energy storage. And this will be key because as you add more and more renewables to the grid, uh, for example, in the UK, as you add more and more offshore wind farms to the UK grid, at some point you need to start looking at long duration energy storage uh, beyond, for example, batteries uh, to make the whole power system still viable. Um, there's a lot of innovations on that front. Those are sort of large scale projects. But if you go down to what's closer to people like you and I, like consumers, there's a lot of other technologies that are ready to deploy. If there is the consumer incentive or if there is a financial incentive to support consumers, we can start deploying smart thermostats so people have more energy efficient heating of homes. We can start to deploy uh, responsive, demand side responsive fridges. The issue is the current grid and the current regulation around how our power system works doesn't enable that. A lot of technologies are there. What they need is a more synergistic business case and support from the government. Now, Adrian, with so much going on in the world, what are some of the other challenges or frustrations facing you and your business today? Um, I'm thinking we've got a cost of living crisis. You also have a factory in a very rural area of Northern Ireland. What about gender balance? What about diversity and inclusion and working with communities? 
we're making progress in those areas. We have a big program for women in manufacturing. We're, we've worked hard to see where we can bring more diversity there. We are limited by our locations as well. It's hard to be truly diverse because you know we're in pockets that uh, don't support complete diversity. It's an interesting debate as well when you think of Brexit. You know, we've been very limited now with uh, workers coming into the UK. That's a, a very big challenge for us. We're seeing um, costs increasing in terms of employing people. We're very focused on decarbonizing and, and wanting to do the right thing for consumers and for our industry. But ultimately, if the cost base gets too high, then we could be subject to cheaper imports from other geographical locations. So how do we manage that? Generally, you know, society hasn't matured enough to realize that we probably as consumers all should be prepared to pay a little more and consume a bit less to try and make things consumable. The supermarkets over the years have trained us to to get things very cheap and that has been obviously a huge positive in terms of cost of living for everybody but that probably isn't sustainable in the future short term cost of living is is very very concerning we employ 2000 people you know and that's a, a big concern we've um, given it what i believe is a good pay raise this year and i think that's been well recognized and received well but we can't keep doing that and costs can't keep escalating so yeah we have to think long and hard about what the, the future entails. Have you found that financial stress is something that maybe employees are coming to you to talk about? We have people trained within the business to to deal with that. I think we're probably seeing it in some of the locations that we operated in more so, Sarah. You know, the demand for food banks. We donate quite a bit um, to local charities and support local initiatives, and we're seeing quite a lot of demand there. And we're seeing cancer care type charities and things. We're seeing them suffering quite a lot because the demand is coming more into food banks and, and housing. And it's a, it is quite a concerning time. We're seeing the cost of energy spiraling, and we're seeing you know people really starting to struggle now. When you, outside of energy and sustainability, you're also passionate about education and policy and development and initiatives around change. Can you tell us a little bit more about your work in these areas? I see education as being inherently tied to the issue of trying to change our planet. A lot of the education work that I do is related to helping young people think critically and to be able to express their thought, being able to discern the cause and effect and be able to think for yourself is the most important skill you can have as a young person going into a very uncertain future. And just to touch on something Adrian said earlier around the cost of living and energy crisis, that it is our historical reliance on oil and gas, our technological slog, our lack of imagination when it comes to deploying policy support for things like, for example, renewables and green hydrogen and early stage innovation that would be required to accelerate these technologies and these solutions that also contributed to us being in the stage where we are at today. The economic crisis that we face today, or so many of us face today, could have been avoided much, much earlier, or at least the impact of it could have been greatly mitigated. And so for me, all these things, the cost of living crisis that we face today, the education initiatives that we're trying to push across the platforms that we're engaged with, but also my consulting work when it comes to climate change and sustainability are all related. It is about encouraging people to think a little bit more into the future, to be a bit critical about what the media, what the government, what businesses are telling them. And to realize oftentimes we already have the, the talent, the technology and the tools at our disposal. But what we lack is the kind of interdisciplinary thinking that would allow us to overcome collective challenges that we have in society. I'd love at this point to see if either of you had questions for each other. Yeah, I, I suppose it would just be good to understand how you go about organically creating and encouraging these sustainability initiatives within your firm. Is that more of a sort of a top-down process where you have a committee or do you actually encourage your suppliers to get involved as part of that process? It's probably a bit of all. I think we took a step change whenever we appointed a sustainability director. The fact that we have someone heading it up and that we have someone with such passion and energy is just great. You know, if you look at our, our footprint, um, the energy usage, it's huge. But one of the first initiatives was, you know, how can we take waste out of every day? And the sum total of that probably wasn't hugely significant in terms of our environmental footprint. But in terms of how it changed the mindset, it was amazing. I think a lot of what we realized is that people wanting to start their careers today have lots of choice or people wanting to change career. So why would you come and work in heavy manufacturing, in packaging, in a glass industry? So we're trying to address those things as well. So our values are upfront and center in everything we do. 
our new um, employees and starts will realize the values before they start with the business. And then that naturally means that myself, the rest of the executive committee, have a big commitment to, to bringing change around. So I think all those things work in concert very well together. We have some some big initiatives as well. We have three major plants, four actually now. We've just had a, a bit of an acquisition recently. If we look across all of the plants in Northern Ireland and County Fermanagh, we think the biomethane is probably a large part of the answer for that plant. We don't have much sun. We don't have any real prospect of getting hydrogen. We can't electrify our process completely, so we need to bring in alternative fuels to energy, be it biofuel, biomethane, hydrogen, whatever it may be. So we think biomethane, given the large agriculture industry in Northern Ireland, is probably a big opportunity for us. In the plant here in uh, Cheshire, where I'm based, we have the largest furnaces in the world. We have a huge gas usage, and we've been up front and centre with government in trying to bring the Hynet project uh, to the fore. So the Hynet is one of two projects in the UK that is getting government support to introduce blue hydrogen. Blue hydrogen is good for us as an industry because it allows us to transition sooner faster and be ready for green hydrogen when it may come. So we've done a, a huge amount of work there with the local authorities, governments and everybody to be part of the hydrogen story. So we're, we're saying by 2030, we believe we can have the first truly net zero glass bottles in the market. This could be one of the first packaging materials to decarbonize. And it's largely dependent on hydrogen being available and how we learn to use hydrogen and adopt it as a technology. We have customers coming to us now wanting to sign up for a new furnace for glass produced with hydrogen, and they're really pushing us hard. We're pushing government hard for financial support to make sure that the cost of hydrogen is similar to natural gas. And then throughout the business, we're you know really getting a, a culture of doing things the right way. Resource efficiency is a big one as well, doing things right the first time, not wasting. I think if you see the the work we've done and the awards we've received with business in the community. We won an award both from the manufacturer for a sustainable manufacturing company in the UK. Just inspires us all to, to do more and then and to be more proactive in these spaces. We'll have to mention too, you're being very modest. You also received a prestigious award as Cheshire and Warrington Outstanding Business Leader of the Year. But is it any wonder because you're really tackling it head on and it sounds like it's very costly as well. But whenever you see the impacts and outcomes, 85% of NSERC's customers say they choose NSERC based on your sustainability commitments. So it works. It, it does, Sarah, yeah. I mean, you know, we, we started off as a startup 25 years ago, we've always been entrepreneurial and disruptive and we, we enjoy that space, you know, so, and we have a lot of credibility as well um, at this point in time, given what we've done in terms of our industry. And then when we talk about things that we want to do, people buy into that and they believe it because we've done so much in the past. It's very busy. But uh, it's always really energising uh, to have these type of conversations and try and influence people. Yeah, it really is. When you, I'm sure you're heartened to hear that. And and I suppose it would reinforces what you do, that any organisation, startup, large organisation, it really is about embedding that mindset, that culture, those values that everybody shares that sense of drive and not, not just the CEO. I think also it, it's a testament to the idea that it's really important to communicate your, your vision and that this is being this being an interdisciplinary problem. Every organization, government or businesses need to understand how the policies or their plans will be perceived and how to ensure people are engaged. Because to Adrian's point, maybe the question around blue hydrogen is making sure people understand the energy transition is not just a, you know, starting at a static state, ending in a static state. There will be many interim states in between. It's an ongoing, continuous transition transformative process. Your ability to communicate that is very important. Sometimes people I know who would say hydrogen is just a Trojan horse for oil and gas companies, but they need to understand the role that hydrogen can play. And similarly today in Europe, you're still seeing the debate of blue versus green hydrogen. And a lot of times I think this comes down to different groups not being able to reach across and speak the same language to each other. So this is why it's an interdisciplinary problem. It's not just a technology or business issue. Adrian, would you like to come in on that? I couldn't agree more. It's one I heard a few months ago, and I think it's really good. People, you know, really overestimate what they can do in a day or a week, and they underestimate what they can do in a year or a decade. So we've got to accept that this is a transition, but every change we make will add up and it in the end will probably come faster. There's an imperative on us today to start making change. 
I'm not sure everybody really gets that. You know, we had in England this year, we had our first day with 40 degrees and everybody for weeks afterwards was going, yeah, climate change, we've got to do something. Today, yeah, it's probably fallen off the agenda, probably given some of the challenges that we're seeing as well. So it's very hard to, to balance those things. It's really important to make the right decisions today for the future as well. I have a question for when you, one of the things that we think can be very interesting for glass is the circular economy. You know, we can get to 100% recycled material, but there's about 600,000 tonnes of glass every year in the UK that goes into black bin uh, waste and doesn't make its way back to us. When we don't get recycled material, we're digging up sand, we're producing soda ash, we're really harming the environment in these materials. So we want to get people to understand more about um, how glass is a material that if you choose it on the shelf, first of all, you consume it and you dispose of it in the right way. And I, I really just mean putting it in a recycling bin. We then get it back as a raw material and then we can use it. And it's something that I think the, the governments are poor on. I think the brand owners are poor on. And it's really just a question for you when you, you know, as a younger person, do you see glass as a good material? If we put the right proposition out there, do you think people will, will buy into the prospect of glass being a really good long-term sustainable material? Y yes, I, I do think so. I'll be honest, I, I wouldn't say I can speak on behalf of <laughs> obviously all the young people out there. When it comes to identifying in society, and I think we're largely right that most of the masses may not put a premium on sustainability, or at least not explicitly when they when they buy. I think most people I know would prefer to opt for whatever feels sustainable. This generation of digital natives is it's not just about the choices they make; it's about the brand they're consuming, the the, the philosophy they're buying into when they're buying a product. I often feel that the way we treat our waste reflects us as a society. Often our mentality is. The product after consumed, it's done. That's the end of my responsibility as a consumer. That's the end of, a lot of times, the responsibility of the company. And I think this is a fundamental issue. Just to maybe raise an example, in, in Taiwan, almost everyone recycles by default. It's actually quite interestingly the, the byproduct of a different policy. Um, Taiwan being a very densely populated urbanized island means that public hygiene in cities are extremely important to avoid rodents and a bunch of other pests. Everyone keeps their waste at home and they only take it out when the recycling truck passes every day. And I remember one time going back for summer and having not recycled and uh, the neighbor granny was telling me off. It's very normal. There's two trucks. There's one truck for the normal rubbish or one truck for all the recycling. You have to put your trash into uh, transparent trash bags. Everyone knows if you're following or not. And there's peer pressure to do the right thing. So it was initially a hygiene policy. The government quickly realized and captured that and developed that into a much more widespread waste policy of creating a cultural code for people to recycle. I think we want to move towards a society where we engender this sense of responsibility for the waste that we're throwing out. And I don't see any policies directly addressing that. If we actually were to channel a lot more of our talent when it comes to policy and behavioral psychology and behavioral economics into looking at this issue of how do we engender more res responsibility for waste, I think we'll have a solution, but that's just not a priority for our society. Excellent. Listen, guys, I want to ask you as individuals now, personally, yes, you're responsible leaders, but on a personal level, what are you committed to doing more of or less of in the coming year when you? I think for hundreds of years, the most significant leverage you can have to push for a good idea or to push for a good product or to do good things as a group of individuals is capital. I think slowly over time that has changed to technology. And I think today is talent. We have generational talents in, in coding and in economics in engineering that are working for companies that frankly are not all that all socially impactful. For me, I think the most important thing outside of you know my day-to-day -day consulting job is to get more young people into the space to realize this much more than what they originally think about. When they hear having a green career, they instinctively think conservation, waste management. There's a very narrow understanding of how anyone from diverse backgrounds, regardless of a discipline, can make a huge difference. And I think I want to encourage that curiosity in exploring quote unquote green careers, whether it's in clean energy, sustainability, or just being an entrepreneur in some of the well-established companies. And I think if we can channel talent 
towards this problem rather than some of the problems that people are being paid six figures in the U.S. to solve that really doesn't help us at all, then I think we go a long way in addressing our problems. I don't think there's anything more significant than the leverage of talent. If I was starting over again, I would definitely be looking for a a green career. Adrian, what about you? It's really, for me, a lot of it's about making clever decisions and, and making better decisions, of course, and that's the less of. More of, I think, you know, I can do a lot in my role in terms of influencing brand owners, government and things like that. And that, that does happen. So I'd like to keep doing more and more of that. I think one of the areas that I've noticed in the last while is that small, medium enterprises are really struggling. I think for bigger corporates, shareholders and social responsibility is a big thing and you know that drives good behaviors generally speaking so i've had a few of them come to me recently and ask what can we do and how can we work together so i think we're back to the the community piece sarah how can you know nsirc as a company use its influence to share amongst or the, the glass industry, but probably we can even have more of an impact looking at other industries local and locally and working closely together. Try and you know, look at small clusters where industries work together and share things. You know, if we have waste heat in our process, can somebody else use that waste heat? And then when we go down to social impacts and you know, how can we support local community groups and and help people out? And you know, even things like our canteens, can we open them, you know, and give people maybe free food? And with the power of two thousand people, getting those people together to go right what can we do as a company and a society and as people, I think there's there's a lot we can do there to help. And I think that's going to be really necessary, unfortunately, for the next few months at least and maybe even longer. Absolutely. Those collective ideas and having everybody feel that they they have a right to to think of, of something better for the future. A great conversation for this episode of The Lens. We've been exploring environmental sustainability and climate action with Adrian Curry, Managing Director of NSERC and Wen Yu Wang, Principal Consultant of Energy and Utilities Practice at PA Consulting. You've been listening to The Lens with me, Sarah Travers. If your business would like help to become more responsible and ensure your workplaces are fairer, you enhance the planet by becoming greener and work together with others, then get in touch at www.bitc.org.uk. Thanks for listening and tune in next time.